Hi everyone. So today I'll be showing a little bit kind of interesting thing that I'm started doing in my lab here. Well, actually I've been doing it for probably, probably maybe almost a year now. Um, kind of experimenting with doing things that may or may not be supported within Windows 10, um, but it appears to work. Um, so one of, one of the things that I'm uh, actually doing here is I'm um, actually running a store space, uh, a tiered store space on a Windows 10 desktop, essentially. And then um, what I'm doing, I am actually um, have a, a storage direct um, set up um, for lab for so I can experiment with it, as well as a, a, a general purpose store server with deduplication enabled um, running on, on this same server as well. But let me just show you a little bit about um, well, not more so much about, but um, how, how I'm doing that. So, um, I've had a lot of this hardware for um, probably 10 years-ish going on. Um, <clears throat> and I'm using a, um, a high point um, RAID controller, um, but I'm just passing the, the disk through it as JBot. And attached to that, I have um, se several um, eSATA um enclosures that I also have attached to the to the controller so there's um this says enclosure count four but there's only there's actually only two enclosures but um, each enclosure has um, two ports so the controller is um, understanding those as being independent controllers so I should have 15 hard drives connected to these and again these hard drives a lot of these hard drives are pretty old um, as I um, got different systems over the years or and converted some of my drives from um, standard hard drives to SSDs in, in some of my main system. I kind of just start throwing these disks in here and, and since they still work, they they still seem to work, um, performance seem okay, they don't have a ton of bad sectors so I kind of moved those and start moving those into this enclosure um, and having these be in my like general purpose storage for um, for my lab VMs, um, ISOs and other things like that. So we'll just take a look at um, <clears throat> the logical structure of how the disks are presented at the controller level. And the thing about like the high point, um, so this they don't really support this particular controller, it seems really much anymore. Um, so the um, it's kind of a web-based interface. It's kind of kind of kind of janky a little bit. It doesn't work as well as I um, would like. But um, as you saw, it's kind of it was a Pretty much a, a big delay after I clicked logical before they actually showed up. So as you can see here, I have um, several different drives, some so different several different sizes and brands and, and things like that. So the majority of them are Hitachi. Um, so I, I got a lot of had a, a lot of one terabyte Hitachi drives over the years. Um, a lot of these, um, as I mentioned, um, they're probably like pushing on eight eight to ten year old, uh, but they're they're still working. So. Um, I have had a few of them fail over over time, so I have to swap them out, and so that, that's why I, did, I have this actually four terabyte here. That's one of the newer drives that I um, put in there um, because I have one of the older Hitachi drive um, actually finally died, uh, so I kind of swapped that out and bought like a just a regular um, SATA um, drive. Um, not it's not a NAS specific drive. It's not a um, like a a high performance um, black drive or anything like that, just a general everyday compute drive. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of how it looks from um, here. So I'm just passing everything through as a, as a JBot, just passing it straight through, not using any of the RAID controller um, functionality of, of the controller itself. All right, so let's go ahead and jump back over to Windows. So on the Windows side, um, so on Windows 10, it, it, you can configure storage spaces directly um, within the GUI. Um, however, there's um, a couple couple things that's going on with that when you do it only through the GUI. So when you do it through the GUI, it's going to automatically pick a column size for you. And what the column size is, is that um, as data is being written um, to, to the drives that you have, um, say if you have a two-way mirror, um, so in that case, a column, say a one column in the case of a two-way mirror actually requires two disks, so the data has to be written to, to both both drives. Um, the other things about the columns, the columns can, can determine how fast you can actually write. Um, it also determines uh, like as you want to scale how many drives you may need to add as a complete set. So if you have a really high column count in order for you to 
expand your storage, you're going to have to add more disks all at the same time. So when you create it with the with the, just a regular GUI, when you're creating uh, like a new storage space, um, it doesn't give you any option to configure the columns or anything. It just does it all automatically for you. Uh, and from a performance perspective, what I noticed as I started playing with the column size, for example, so uh, as I mentioned, I, had, I actually have 15 physical disks that's in this in this um, array here. And um, I believe by default with the two-way mirror, I think it picked uh, like a one column, like a one column um, um, size. Um, so what that means is I'm writing data, um, even though I have 14 disks uh, for each read or write, it's only actually using two of those disks uh, for each one of those. And then it's kind of, it'll randomly pick two disks every time it needs to do something. Um, so what I noticed, like my um, write, write through, write, my um, like um, sequential write throughput was not very good. It's pretty much the speed of a single disk. Um, so I'm um, doing some experimentation. Um, I changed my column count to, um, I believe I changed it to like six. Um, and um, the performance dramatically increased. So I went from probably like maybe 60 megabyte or so, um, 60, 70 megabyte writes to about 350 megabyte writes. So it was a pretty dramatic increase. Um, however, the downside of that is that, uh, um, again, when it comes to if I want to expand this at some time, I would need that many more disks to actually do that um, in order to um, have enough disks available to write the data to um, as it's coming in. Um, so I, um, I experimented with that, um, had that running for a while. Um, it worked worked pretty well. And um, then I was like, uh, I was like, um, can I actually use um, tiered? Can I use SSDs? Can I int introduce SSDs into this? Um, so I did a lot of experiment, moving moving data off of here, moving it like to another storage array, and then rebuilding this and experimenting and see see what actually works. And what I ultimately end up doing. So now um, there's actually um, so as I mentioned, there's there's 15 regular spinning drives. Uh, I also have now added two SSDs into the mix now here too. So we have a uh, like a 512 SanDisk drive there. And another, um, this one may be a 480 gig uh, SSD um, that, that I have in the mix here. So what's happening now is how I configured it is that um, I, I still I have to had to use the one column still um, because now since I have the two tiers, I have a, a tier of SSD storage and then I also have a tier of regular hard drive storage. Uh, my column has to match whatever my SSD tier is now. Um, because I'm restricted by that. So since I only have two SSDs and I'm using the two-way mirror, I'm, I'm restricted to that one column count. Um, but introducing those SSDs in, in front, uh, my, hot, my hot data that's, um, that's coming in, um, that's get writ written immediately to the SSDs and then it get destaged de and detiered off into the, to the spinning hard drives as they as it's become not as used in, in coal. And um, the other thing that um, I noticed, that my latency has greatly improved um, since I um, implemented this. Because um, so what it enables is a like a write, I believe it was a write back, write back cache, um, like a one gigabyte one write back cache. Um, I believe I configured mine for ten gig for for this uh, through some help of um, a colleague that kind of gave me some tips and things like that on how I could do that. Um, so uh, yeah, the performance got significantly better. Um, latency dropped significantly. And then I still have the benefit of having like a lot of storage where I have to have like tons and tons of SSDs to, to get that. So it's, it's a good compromise and, and balance um, for, for my use case. So it's like I said, I, I use this, I use this storage for essentially a kind of a SAN for um, my virtualization environment, as well as like general file storage and, and things like that. They're, they're kind of utilizing the storage um, that's on this desktop system um, um, as their storage. Um, however, I, I'm not serving this storage out through the Windows 10. Um, as I mentioned, um, on top of this Windows 10, I have several storage servers as well as a backup server um, that's running that they are um, utilizing that, that storage that's um, being, being
being pushed out. So take this storage one server, uh, so it just have a general boot drive, and then I also have like two data disks that's exposed out to it. Those two data disks are on top of this tiered um, storage space. Um, and then I enabling things like deduplication and things like that, so I get um, more better utilization of the storage even beyond um, um, what it's doing on the physical host. So within the VM, um, any duplicated data that, that is found, um, that gets duplicated and I get that space claim back. So um, yeah, that's, this, this has been working pretty well. So um, I'm going to show you a little bit of um, how I accomplish this. So it may not be the like best practice or the best way to do this, um, but this is something that has, has worked for me. Um, I haven't had any major problems with it, even like when I had like this start failing, um, I was able to come to the GUI here. It would tell me that, hey, one of the disks would have like a warning or a red mark next to it. And I could, um, I don't think it said prepare for removal. I can't remember what it said underneath it, but there was like a message underneath it. And once I would click that, um, what it would tell me is that, hey, um, go ahead and replace that disk. And then once I replace that disk and then add it, like I'll go here and say add drive. And then once I added that drive in, any data that was um, lost, well, no, no data was lost. Let's say any data that was on that disk that had failed, it would, as I would replace that disk, it would, by talking to all of the other disks, um, it would move that data back to that disk. And then um, it would go back green and then everything would be all good and, good and healthy. Because um, what will happen like as, as disk fail, um, up here, I would get a warning saying like, hey, redundancy is reduced. Um, I need to check my physical drives and then, and then go and remove the bad one. And then it would, as I replace the bad one, it would go, like I said, try to um, move that data from the other disk to the new disk that you added to the array. So um, in this case, I'm only, like I said, I'm only doing a, a two-way mirror. So I only can survive like a single disk, even though I have all of these this here, like a, so if I have two simultaneous simultaneous failures, um, I can potentially lose um, all the data, um, potentially. But um, uh, fortunately, that, that hasn't happened. Um, I've only had like a single disk fail, and then I um, just went and, went and replaced it, put in a new one, and had it rebuild, and every, everything was fine after that. So the other thing you can do um, directly here is that, um, so say if you have some, if you, if you see on these physical disks, you can kind of see how much space each disk is using. So if you start seeing that some of them are like less balanced than others, so let's see, like this is a, well, this is a smaller drive. This is only a one gig versus this being a two gig. Um, but if you see the percentages started getting like way out of whack, um, you can click, click this optimize drive usage button. And what that'll do, it'll go and try to push the, even the data out between all of the disks that you have. Um, so you can get, um, one, you'll get like better utilization of the disk and also better performance. So like as, as the data is being spread out wider across more disks, um, as your systems go to try to access the data, it can leverage more disks and spread out that load better. Because um, the other thing I noticed since, since I've implemented this, um, so say if I'm just doing a single file copy, right, um, I'll get maybe, I'll, I'll max out my one gig link um, typically. Um, and then if I, if I do two, um, I'll actually be able to get a little bit more because um, this system actually is exposing two. I do have two um, gigabit NICs connected to the physical Windows 10 desktop. And then I also have those two Actually, I may have three NICs exposed on the VM, but let me check. I think I have three for this. I was doing, I think I have an internal link as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I have two physical, two physical network adapters that are going out to my real network. And then I also have an internal one um, that I was using to kind of experiment with a little thing. So, I, I believe, um, I'm not sure if I'm doing it anymore, but at one period of time on this particular desktop, I was exposing storage from within the VM back out to the desktop um, as deduplicated data. So um, that way I, I previously used this system as a gaming desktop. Um, so for my like Steam, my Steam games and things like that, um, I had a share um, or a disk that was exposed back out to the desktop. 
and then that data would be du duplicated. So I, I would save a ton of space um, by, by doing that. Um, as well as for my like, personal files and things like that, all, all that stuff would be duplicated um, within, the, within the VM and then exposed back out to the desktop as just a regular drive letter. So for, to my desktop, um, it looks just like any other like drive. Um, but in reality, it's a, a disk that's stored within the VM, then exposed back out into the desktop. So that's that's kind of how how that works. So it's kind of complicated, a, a little bit kind of convoluted. So, for example, like when my when this desktop boots up, there may be a period of time before this VM is ready that drive won't be visible on the desktops, but once the VM gets fully up and, and running, it turns the storage on, turns the shares on and all of that, uh, within a, a few minutes or whatever, that drive will then finally pop back up in the desktop. So you can expose that out as like a share or iSCSI disk. Um, at the time, I believe I was using the iSCSI disk, so um, kind of pretty much make it really easy as far as um, um, Steam is concerned. So it's not showing up as a share or anything like that, it's just showing up as any other disk. Um, that um, I can set as my storage location for for um, for my PC games. So yeah, that that worked worked pretty well. So um, what, what I'm going to show you next. Um, so we kind of talked about well what this is and kind of what it's doing. Uh, as I said, I do have a storage spaces direct um, experiment going on here as well. Um, may talk about that a little bit more in, a, in another another um, video on um, storage spaces direct and kind of how what that is and what you can do with it and, and things like that. Um, but for the purpose of this one, I just kind of want to show what I'm doing with um, tiered spaces. Uh, pretty much have a tiered storage space on a Windows 10 desktop um, that was configured on Windows 10. So as I mentioned, you can't do the tiered through the GUI. The GUI has really has no knowledge or exposure to do anything with tiering, but you can do it through PowerShell. So uh, I'm going to jump over to um, PowerShell and kind of just show you some of the code and, and things on how that was accomplished. All right, so um, here I'm over on within PowerShell. And what I'm going to show you here, this is a little bit of PowerShell code that's going to show you. Um, this is not a tier space that I'm showing here. This is just a regular, um, this will be a regular storage space. Uh, but in this case, we're going to be forcing it to use a different column size than what the GUI will do for you. Um, so if you recall, as, as I mentioned, where as, as I experimented with the various different column sizes, I was able to like, so I would let the GUI build one, then I would do some benchmarks, um, would read, write performance, and then I would build one using PowerShell, um, playing with the various different column size, and then do those exact same um, benchmarks and see what the results are. And so when I, as I was doing those experiments, um, even before I've involved SSDs or tiering or anything like that, um, I noticed there was a dramatic change in the performance that was that was capable from the exact same disk that I had. Um, so um, what I'm showing here, so um, this first part here, I'm just getting all of my storage pools and getting the virtual disks um, that are currently on the drive and then I'm grabbing a few properties um, from that. Um, so currently on this particular server, I only have a single storage pool, I believe. Um, I've had a, I've deleted a lot of the other ones um, that I that I previously had on it as our experimenting. But I'm gonna go ahead just just go ahead and run this and let it pull back that data. Uh, I think I'm on the right one. Yeah. So yeah. So here, um, huh, why did I get any data there? I typo. Uh, so it did find the space though. Uh, that's the friendly name of the space that I currently have that's configured with tiering. Um, so the next thing here, um, I have this command commandlet here, PowerShell new virtual disk. And then I give it a friendly name. So it, this one I'm naming HDD test by column mirror. Um, I'm giving it, telling it what storage pool I would be using. So um, in this case, um, I did have one named HDD only. Um, that one actually no longer exists. Um, so I will need to update my name there. And then I'm going to give it the size. Then I tell it the provisioning type if it's going to be thin or, or fixed. So I would just leave it thin. Resiliency setting name. So if I'm going to be just using like a simple space or mirrored space or, or what is, whatever it's going to be. Physical disk redundancy. Um, so as I mentioned, like a regular two, uh, two, uh, um, regular two-way mirror um, that only has like a one disk redundancy. 
as uh, suppose if I'm doing a two way, then it would be the two. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that because um, um, it's going to get, I, I don't think I have enough disks to do it that many. Uh, yeah, I don't. Um, so next I'm specifying the number of columns. So um, how this works since I'm using a mirror. So if I'm setting my resiliency settings of mirror, right, and I have a column count of five, um, what that means is that I actually need 10 physical disks in order for this to work, right? Um, because what's going to happen is um, uh, each column is going to be um, five physical disks. So when a reader or write happens, um, it's going to be able to, able to spread that across five disks. So I'll get the performance of whatever those five disks can collectively provide. Um, so that's where that huge performance increase and change that, that I mentioned come from by change, manipulating these column size. But the, like I said, the downside is that as you need to expand this, you're going to be kind of restricted to, to that. So say, for example, if I wanted to um, add more disks in, to this particular B disk, um, I would actually need to add those, um, what, five, would it be five disks or ten disks? Um, it'd be five. I would need another set of five that it would be able to use that's different from the ones that it has um, because it's gonna, it needs to be able to write across all those five disks and then it needs to be able to write the, that data you wrote to those five disks to another set of five disks um, so you get the mirrored pair. So in case uh, if any drive within that first mirrored pair dies, right, you still have a whole complete copy in your other set of five disks. So um, hope I'm explaining that right. That's just kind of how I understand it to work. I, I may have said something maybe not 100% factual, um, but that's my understanding and been my uh, observation as I as I experimented with this. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And what did I do wrong there? All right, let me let me check that. Let's see what did I do wrong there. Hold on. Oh, you know what? I, I see what I did. So, um, my so what I had here actually first was was actually correct. Um, so my drive that I my other V disk that I created that the V disk name is tier VM space one, but the actual pool name is HDD only. So that was just a typo. Um, I already had the right thing there. Um, I accidentally well not accidentally I intentionally changed it, um, but I actually didn't need to. So let me just sh show that. Um, so I jump back over here on the storage space section. So you see here I have a my B disk is named TVM space dash one, and I um I didn't need to change that because um, the pool name is actually HDD only, um, which um, when I originally created that that's what I named it because um, this at the time only contained hard disk drives, and then I had another pool that only contained SSDs, but now I kind of intermingled them together in the same pool now. So Let's go in and try to run that again. So let's run that. Oh, yep, another problem. I'm um, I'm not running ele ele elevated. Um, I'm running as a, yeah, like a regular user. So I'm getting permission denied. So let's go and run this elevated. <laughs> I didn't run it as administrator when I started it. So. so it's blocking me from creating that new disk. And, and this, this is good. I, I like getting these errors as, as I'm doing these. Um, Test and experiment for my my own purposes as well as I as I maybe um, need to reference this in some time in the future. Um, I, I'll kind of see what mistakes are kind of easy easily to easy to make um, as you're trying to do this stuff in code. So let me just copy this over. I'll minimize that down so I have my administrator um, PowerShell. All right, so let's take a look at this again. New virtual disk, naming it HDD test by column mirror. It's coming from the storage pool, HDD only. Making a size 330 gigabyte. Um, provisioning type is thin. Um, resiliency setting name is mirror. Um, physical disk redundancy is one. And the number of columns is five. So again, um, that's gonna try to spread that data across, um, you know this says five, um, because I'm using a mirror, it'll be across 10 physical drives um, when it when it'll try to read and write data. So let's try this again. Wish me luck. Just thinking about it. No error. Creating. Doing something. Okay. So now that should be up and going. Right. 
So, um, <clears throat> other thing I didn't mention. So, um, with when you're working with storage spaces, you can um, tag your drives, the media type as HDD or S SD. Um, so my controller um, is it's technically is not a really supported controller for storage spaces um, because the, the main problem with the controller that I have is the controller from really the consumer space and uh, it does not expose until like Windows what the drives are it doesn't it doesn't actually know um, it's just it, it knows that they're hard drives but it doesn't expose that flag back out to the system to tell the system that so through PowerShell I can um, change that media type and say hey this is HDD this is SSD etc um, but um, yeah that's just something to be aware of if you try to do this on your own own system because um, um, one thing I noticed like if you're using uh, a lot of the newer systems that are have like internal that if you're plugging all your drives into your internal motherboard um, those at least all the ones I've used within like the last year or so um, they do correctly expose saying, hey, this is HDD, this is SSD, it exposed those flags out. But this older controller that I have does, does not expose that because that, this controller was created before storage spaces. Um, no, storage spaces may have existed, but the controller is, is really old. But let's jump back over to um, here. So we can see now I have a, a new drive, right? I have a new five, what we call five column mirror um, here, uh, 330 gigabyte, and it's currently not formatted. So, uh, so we got that five column mirror. So also what I'm gonna do, let's go and create a, another 330 gigabyte drive. So I'm gonna create another storage space. Um, I'm gonna just leave everything as is. So I'll use, I'll leave it on NTFS. Um, I guess I could use REFS. I think I heard something in like, a, I think future versions of Windows 10 may remove REFS, except for like the, high-end business version or, or something I thought I read about that I don't know if that's true or not or if that's going to be implemented anytime soon uh, imagine they may get some pushback from that uh, I, I would hope they would just leave both options available um, but I'll, I'll leave this as NTFS uh, for this and I'll just name this um, GUI storage space so I'm not going to change anything um, so here this is kind of what it looks like when you're creating it so you don't get any mention of column spaces or um, all those other like flags that I was feeding in. So you get option two, simple, two-way mirror, three-way mirror, or parity. Uh, so in my experience, I, I typically don't use parity at all um, because the write performance um, is terrible. <laughs> I would just say, just in general, it's, it's, it's not good. Um, so I know on the Windows Server 2016 and newer versions, they've done a lot of work on the parity side where it's supposedly a lot better. Uh, I have not personally experimented with it yet. Um, but definitely on Windows 10 side, um, I would say don't use Parity if you can avoid it um, because the, the write performance is, is just not good. Um, but yeah, read performance is actually good from it, but it, um, writing is it's not good. For, for my use case, I'm doing a lot of writing. Since I, as I mentioned, I'm hosting like virtual machines and stuff like that on top of that. So I'm doing a lot of writes. So I'm going to go ahead and say two-way mirror, try to make it as close as possible to what we made um, through PowerShell. And let's do a 330 gigabyte again. So you see, um, since this is a mirror, um, even though I, I get, I'm going to get 330 gigabyte of usable space, but um, within my storage space, it's actually going to take up 660 gigabyte. So that's something if you're using mirror. And say if I was using three-way mirror, then it would take up nearly a gig, nearly a terabyte uh, for that same use case. And then up here at the top, it kind of gives you some information about it. Um, so that's this is a question that I, I see a lot of people ask that say, okay, I, I want a three-way mirror um, and I have three drives. Storage spaces will not let you do it with, with three drives. So you actually need to have at least five drives to do a three-way mirror, which seems like on, on the surface seems like weird. Like why can't I just use three drives? I have I need three copies, I have three drives, and why doesn't that work? But yeah, the way storage spaces work, um, you actually need a minimum of five drives to do a three-way mirror. So just something to keep in mind. All right, so go ahead, go back to two-way mirror, and we'll let the GUI create us the storage space. Give it a little bit. All right, so now we have we have three different drives. So we have a tiered VM space that that I created through PowerShell. We have a five column mirror storage space that I created through um, PowerShell. And then we have a two-way mirror created through 
the GUI. So what I want to show is um, kind of some of these performance differences that you see. Um, so these two on the surface, like just looking at from here, they look identical, right? right this is a two-way mirror, it's 330 gigabyte. This is a two-way mirror, it's 330 gigabyte. So uh, let me go ahead and format this. I'll just leave it at J drive, leave it at NTFS to kind of make it you know, fairly equivalent from that perspective. Go ahead and format it. Give it a few seconds to format for us. All right, so so now we have now we have our drive. So now I want to I'm gonna um, try to show you uh, the benchmark differences between these drives because um this, this, like I said this this was kind of an eye opener when I realized that hey this column definitely is doing something and it's doing something different than what the GUI allows you to do. So that that was kind of an eye opener to me and like how I can get a lot better performance with the exact same hardware that I already have. And like I said, the, the main benefit, downside would be is that if I ever needed to expand this, I would have to expand with that many more disks. Um, but um, I, I kind of have more storage than I need right now. Um, I, I typically run out of performance before I run out of storage in like all of my systems. So I, I, I'll typically have terabytes and terabytes of storage still available, but I have no more disk I.O. available to um, handle the workloads and experiments in my in my lab and things like that. So what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and jump over to a um, kind of simple, basic um, benchmarking tool that I, that I use from time to time. And just look at what these numbers look like as, as I run them through in these two different scenarios. So um, one wrinkle in this is that um, when I'm using the GUI to create this particular um, two-way mirror, um, because I also have SSDs in the pool, there is a possibility that this space will use that SSD, but it won't use it as a like as a acceleration piece because it, it doesn't really understand. It doesn't know that hey, this SSD that's in the pool is significantly faster than all the other drives, so it'll just use it as any other regular drive with no really knowledge that hey it's, it can be much faster or it may be much faster than others so that, that'll kind of be a wrinkle um uh, actually both of these tiers they exist the way i made them um it'll just use anything in the pool that's available um so um if you see some where the latency is like dramatically lower or the throughput is dramatically higher for a brief period of time um, that may be because it, temp it like when it was doing that read or write, um, it just happened at that, in that instance to pick one of the SSDs to do that read or write operation. So there's just something to keep in mind as I, as I show you some of these benchmarks and show you the difference between the two. So uh, let's jump right over to there. So we're over on the um, same system, but we're looking at um, this tool called Crystal Dismark. So this is a maybe freeware, shareware type program that I'll use from time to time to kind of quickly visualize and, and do some different, various different benchmarks. Um, how it works, it has various different tests over here on the left-hand side that you can perform, or you can hit all and do all of them. And then um, this number here is this, you can have it loop through and do each test a certain number of times. So I have it set at the default of five, and then you can tell it how large of a test file that you want to work with. So I'm, I left all of those at the default, and then I ran some tests for the iDrive. Um, so um, looking at some of the numbers here, um, what we're seeing is, um, so definitely in some of these tests, I can tell by um, some of the numbers are significantly higher than I would expect it to be if uh, it only used the hard drives, especially as I get down to this 4KB size. So we see when it was doing the reads, um, I'm pretty fairly confident that it layered most of that stuff or read most of that from the hard drives because that's like a number in line with the hard drive. Um, however, on the right side, See, this number is dramatically higher. So, especially for these four, these 4K um, reads, writes. So that tells me that um, these definitely got a boost from the SSD that's in the um, storage pool. Um, and then that's not, uh, like I said, it's not due to the storage pool or this particular storage pool or this particular VDIS understanding that it has SSD in the mix. Um, it's just more so that um, because it's in that same pool, it will just randomly pick this to use and we just 
happened for these particular benchmarks, it got the benefit in acceleration when it picked the uh, SSDs to perform some of the, the tests. Um, but um, these numbers at the top, as far as the read and write, those are pretty much in line with what I expect for the reads from the hard drive tier. Um, so this this is not the most accurate test since I have those the wrinkle with SSDs again in there. Um, they can kind of skew the results a little bit. It's like I may be able to run this again and the numbers could be dramatically different if it doesn't pick the SSDs at all that time. Um, but this kind of give you an idea of um, what that performance looks look like. And, and again, uh, the iDrive, that is the one I created with the GUI. So that's a two-way mirror storage space with the GUI that, that we're looking at here. So um, next, we're, I'm going to go and run uh, the same tests, um, but with from the J drive using that um, PowerShell created volume that, that I created. All right, guys. So the, the benchmark is currently in progress now, but I just kind of want to point out. So you see already I'm starting to get the first result back. And you can see the read speed is actually nearly three times um, what I got um, with the GUI created one. Um, so we're going to let the rest of these tests run and see how that looks. Um, also, the other thing to note is that the latency is actually um, a little, quite a bit better um, because, again, we're, we're spreading that across 10 disks as opposed to the settings that the regular GUI um, picks. So right now, for the second test, we're already averaging about double um, what we got on the previous test. So just want to let you let you see that as it's going, um, but I'm going to let the rest of these tests run, and then we'll I'll we'll be right back after um, after these finish. All right, those those benchmarks kind of have wrapped up. So um, let's take a look at what we have here. So take a look, look at the the reads at QDEF32. We see the reads were dramatically faster, so we're nearly a three x factor improvement. And the only thing we did, like we created a similar two way mirror, um, but in this case I use my own settings as opposed to what the GUI put on the disk. We broke the results in a three time performance improvement by doing that. <clears throat> and then on the right side, I um, got a small little bump, um, not, as, not as dramatic, um, but did get a little bump in performance over what we got from the GUI side. And then um, moving down to the, um, the four kilobyte in QDEF8, um, so we got about 3.4 megabyte on the GUI created one, and we're at a factor of a double, pretty much double, almost double performance on the reads. And then take a look at the writes, there's about 53 megabyte on the GUI created one versus about 70 megabyte on the PowerShell created one. Um, and that, that kind of uh, performance increase um, kind of continues down the line. So we see here, there's about 3.5 megabyte on the GUI created one. And again, we're at a double, pretty much double by using those other settings, um, given the amount of disks we have. And then um, 85 megabyte on the PowerShell created one, and then only about 38 megabyte on the GUI created one. So again, we're using all the same drives, all the, it's the same pool. Um, main difference is that I change the settings, and we're getting getting these difference in performance number. Um, so so one number um, here, so like on the last one here, the 4 KB. Q1, um, maybe about a 50% improvement. So um, most of that was still hitting like the hard drive in both cases. And then on the right, so there was about 42 meg and then 38 here. So um, on this one, there was actually a, a slight decrease in performance. Um, but uh, like I said, this is not a perfect test or example um, because um, I have a lot of anomalies and like it's not standardized <laughs> as far as my environment. So uh, there's two factors working um, in here that can kind of as you run this benchmark, at least in my lab, um, from time to time, the performance will could be different. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is that I have those SSDs in the mix, but the, this particular VDIS doesn't understand tiering. It's not doing any type of tiering. It's just using those SSDs when it comes across them as regular, regular any other disk. It's treating exactly the same as it does the regular hard drive. Um, the other factor is that I have different types and brands of drives in different size um, and a few of them are actually different spindle, spindle speed as well. So I know my one terabyte drives are all 7200 RPM um, but they're about eight or nine years old, like somewhere between eight and ten years old for, for, for most of them. And then I have um, like I think I have like a three terabyte and four terabyte and two terabytes in there and um, those larger drives um, 
are, um, I believe they're maybe like 50, 400 RPM. Um, so the newer drives, um, even though they have a, a slower spindle, they can actually burst data across faster than my older drives. However, they'll do it with more latency. So my older drives, they can't burst as fast, burst as much data across the wire, um, but they have slightly lower latency when they when they do that. Um, so depending on which disk is being picked as, as it goes through it and do the reads and writes, um, we kind of get gonna get some irregularity in between that. Um, so if you have kind of all the same type of drives, then you wouldn't have that problem. But um, like I said, in, in my lab, I kind of just start repurposing these disks. Like if they, they were still working, uh, I just kind of repurposed them and threw them in the enclosure and then threw them into this pool. And then this is how I'm currently using using them. So um, yeah, I think hope that gives you a, a good idea. Um, so like this is um, doing this on the Windows um, 10, but you could you could do the same thing on the Windows Server as well. It's just for, for my use case, I'm, I have them on the, uh, Windows 10. And like, like I said, the controller I'm using is more so from the consumer space. It's not really that well supported anymore. Um, like Windows Server storage spaces, like if I try to configure storage spaces from the GUI in Windows Server 2016, it will not touch this controller. It, it just will not do anything with it because um, from when, when I put this controller in a Windows Server 2016 server, uh, from Windows Server 2016 perspective, it sees every single one of my 15 drives as only one drive. And, and the reason for that is this controller does not send a unique identifier for every single drive. Um, they all actually identify as the, as the exact same identifier. So the Windows Server storage spaces GUI um, it, it's, it's based on having those unique identifiers, so it won't it won't touch it. It just won't. It'll just see one drive and, and that's it. Um, so you can configure it through PowerShell, uh, but trying to do it through the GUI is just a total no go on the server side. It just it just doesn't work because it only sees one drive, even though I have 15 physical drives. Um, it's just I have a really old dumb controller that doesn't not not really supported. It doesn't send the things that the server is expecting the controller to tell it. So um, I hope this giving give me a good good idea of um, like I said, um, if you're playing around with storage spaces and and you have a lot of drives, um, this is kind of something you can do to actually get better performance out of the exact same hardware uh, because of, just because of the way the storage spaces work. And like like I said, your mileage may vary. Like um, you may be better with four columns or three columns, or um, you can experiment with the different um, settings depending on how many drives you have. Or even not even using mirroring, right? You may not may not use mirroring if you don't ha really have a requirement for redundancy and things like that. Um, if you're okay, like you use you lose one disk, all your data is gone. If you're okay with that, um, um, the uh, simple would may give you even better performance um, by using this method. But again, if you do it through the GUI, it's going to pick its own column size, so your performance will likely be lower. Um, versus like if you start using PowerShell to create these VDIS with various different settings. Um, but um, there's a lot of other settings you can tweak. So as I mentioned, like as you start getting to like the tiered space, um, you can um, configure different like catch size and, and things like that in, in front of that tier. Um, so that, that's something else you can do. So um, actually, let's, let's actually do one more. Let's actually take a look at what the tiered space looks like because the numbers will probably look a little bit different there as well. So let's go ahead and kick off um, a benchmark for um, for this ACE drive. So let's go do that. And we'll get that going. We'll take a look at what that looked like. All right, so the, the benchmark for the tier space is going. So right off the bat, what you see, the, the read speed is significantly slower than my um, five column two-way mirror and the big cop reason for that is because remember um, I'm using when I'm using this tiered space my SSD tier only has two drives so I'm restricted by that on how many columns I have so my tier space can't spread the data across as many drives simultaneously um, however I, I have kind of like this SSD um, uh, space in front of everything so that can in, ingest um, like a high level of writes and things like that um, and accelerate and decrease the latency of, of everything overall. 
Um, so when it comes to my virtual machines and things like that, um, the user experience and responsiveness of my VMs are better and when I have the tiered space because I'm getting that um, intentional acceleration coming from the SSDs versus when I'm in the, like say in this pool down here, um, I may occasionally get the benefit of the SSD, but not on any consistent or controlled way. Um, so we'll let the rest of these numbers run. We'll let the rest of this run and we'll take a look at what the results look like afterwards. Because um, let's imagine like a lot of these, it's from a benchmark perspective, um, a lot of numbers will probably be lower um, than um, my other space. Um, however, um, like I said, the user experience from my VMs is, is, uh, is notably different um, versus uh, the other space. So we'll, we'll be back in a, I'll be back in a minute, let this, these run instead of bore you with um, watching all these runs. So we'll be right back. All right, so the, those benchmarks I have um, just kind of wrapped up. So taking a look at the numbers, right? Uh, purely at the numbers on this from this tier space, right? We're looking at um, 100, about 155.6 megabyte on the reads at QDEF32. So like taking a look at that at face value at that number, right? Um, it's like um, more than half of what we saw on the J drive with the five columns. But remember, since we're doing this tier space, we're restricted on our columns by this SSD tier. So for example, if I have more SSDs um, where I could actually build five columns, right? Um, this would be dramatically faster than the numbers we're seeing here, but um, using the exact same hardware with different configuration, just, this is the number you get. So like I said, on face value, this may look like, oh, I, I probably should just use this if I, if, I, if I really just need that read, fast read performance. Um, this may be the best option to actually use this without any tearing or anything involved. Then as we go down the list, um, on the read at um, QDEF of 8 or 4K, we got about 2.7 megabyte. So in, in this case, that's actually the worst performance out of uh, the, all of the tests we've done so far, right? Um, going down to the next one, about 2.7 megabyte again. And again, that is the worst performance out of all of these, all right? And then down to QDEF1, we have about 0 0.85 megabyte. Um, it's not the worst, not the best, so it's in between for that, that benchmark. Moving over to the right side. So on the right side, we got 131 megabyte. Um, again, this is actually the worst benchmark score out of the, all the tests we've done with the three different configurations. Uh, moving over to the right um, here, um, now we're trying to start to finally see it perform a little better. So our 4KB QDEF8 got about 105 megabyte, which is almost um, almost double of what we got on the GUI created one, and maybe about um, about 50% faster than what we got on the uh, five column two way mirror. And then moving over to um, QDEF32 at 4KB, we got 135.8 megabyte. And that is about four, like a four X improvement, roughly, of what we got on the GUI created one. And again, maybe about a 50% improvement above what um, we got on the five column two way mirror. And then moving down to the 4KB at QDEF of one, we got about 39 megabytes. So that's roughly, I, they're all in the ballpark on that, on that particular number across the board. So about 38 there, 42 there, 39. So not a big difference in there. Um, so that's looking at just the high level numbers, right? Um, however, like I said, from the user experience and how my VMs feel on this tiered space versus any of these other ones, um, this one is the clear winner. Um, Cause I, this doesn't do, this particular tool doesn't do latency tests, um, but having that SSD tier in front um, dramatically helps with latency. So as I click on things within my VM, um, they're significantly more responsive um, on this tiered VM space um, that I created through PowerShell versus um, the GUI created one that I showed you I created or this um, PowerShell one that I, I show you the creation of them.
Okay, so now we're we're back in PowerShell ISE, and what I hope I can show <laughs> is um, a little bit of how you could do create a tiered storage space on uh, essentially a non-server OS and Windows for, so Windows 10. Um, since the GUI doesn't allow you to do it, and then in the case if you have um, like these weird controllers that don't expose um, the disk and things, how the um, tools are expecting, then um, you, you can't do it through the GUI. So even in server 2016. Um, so um, starting off, um, what I'm doing here is I'm setting these variables up. So I have this data disk variable that will go and get all of my physical disks, and then it's gonna filter them down to only the ones that are greater than um, 600 gigabytes. Since I, I know out of all of my disks, um, the drives that are greater than 600 gigabytes are um, hard disk drives. And all the ones that are less than 600 gigabytes, those are SSDs. Um, so um, in your whatever you're doing in your environment, you'll have to um, change these values appropriately based on size. Or you can use some other filtering mechanism other than size. Um, so say if the, I don't know, the manufacturer of the drive or the friendly name of the drive are all from, um, I don't know, Western Digital for um, your hard drives and are from like Intel for your SSDs, then you can filter by that. But in my case, I just use the size. Um, so what I'm doing here, I'm not going to actually run all of this because I've already done a lot of this and I don't want to break what I currently have. So I'm not going to actually run all of this code in this here, but I'll just kind of explain what it is, um, what my intentions and what I was trying to make it do, and then go from there. So um, I'm going to just run this part of the code here. So I'm just going to go ahead and run that. All right. So what that does that in my data disk variable now, if I go in out with that to the screen. So I should see, there I go. I have a list of all of those drives that match that criteria that I specified. And um, so you can see a lot, a lot of those um, drives all there. Um, look, like I have a few that are um, I didn't set the media flag on. Um, so I think this one is like a um, that's uh, another retro disk that's coming from somewhere else. It's not part of the pool. And this one actually, this is that four terabyte drive that I recently added. So I, I didn't go back in and manually tell the system that hey, that is a HDD drive. Because um, again, my controller does not expose that information, so it always shows up. Actually, all of these initially showed up as unspecified before I went and manually changed that. Um, so the next part of this block here, I'm not going to actually run that um, in this environment here. But um, so the next part is that um, after those disks are they're in the pool, right? They've already been added to the pool. So um, a part that I didn't show, um, I want want you to see this. Um, right now, I, I'm in a slightly failure state. Um, and um, I kind of want to let you see what that looks like. Um, so right now, all of my data, all my drives, everything is still available and readable. Um, however, I'm getting these warnings saying reduce, reduce resiliency, check the physical drive section. And um, that's due to, if I scroll down here, um, remember I told you I have that tiered SSD tier. So I'm getting a warning on, on this one SSD drive because essentially it's unplugged from the system right now. So um, that's kind of how that will show up. So um, I can either... Um, to repair that, I can add another disk, um, say, say I were to add another SSD to this environment, and then I would actually have to go and run the PowerShell to tell the, the pool that, hey, this is an SSD, and, and then what will what happen, it will realize that and say, hey, um, I have this other SSD that I need to be mirroring, right? So all the data that's um, here, right, it will start mirroring that to that replacement disk. So I just kind of want, want, you, want you to see that. And then and also, um, um, say if this you had just recently created a new pool in Windows 10, you can just simply go to Add Drives and add those additional drives in um, that way. Um, you also can do it through PowerShell, but um, I don't uh, I don't have that code at least in this file. I think I have it somewhere else on how to do that. Um, but um, but yeah, this is something to be aware of. So, okay, so that, that's that. That's the HDD data disk that I'm specifying. So moving down, we have the cache disk. So again, in my environment, that's the disk that I'm intending to use as SSDs. And, and uh, again, in my lab, um, I have another SSD that is not part of this pool. Um, so that will be pulled into this variable for this example. 
Um, so in your case, if you have that same situation, um, you would um, you have to figure out a different filtering mechanism so you don't pick up a drive you don't want. And there is a pool, there's a um, um, value on these drives that I think it says can pool. You can filter on that. Uh, so those other drives, they, they'll have the can pool flag set to false, so they, they mean they can't be added to the pool. Um, so you can filter by that as well. So I could filter by both the size and the can pool flag in order so I don't pick up those other disks. Um, just, again, something to be aware of. But I'm going to go ahead and run this. Um, just the first part. I'm not going to run the second part. And then go look at that cache disk variable. So there we go. So I can see I can see three SSDs. And this here go that SSD that uh, I just demonstrated that's actually... Um, not communicating right now, um, so that that's a kind of intentional thing there. So uh, yeah, you'll have your your disk um, in that variable now, and which way I can go and use that later. All right. So and I put a few notes here, um, kind of read it off as I am um, going through this uh, demonstration. Is that um, this disk get did get disk that can be pulled. So um, you note know, you can add your disk to the pool using the GUI easily in Windows 10 without the restriction for having a unique identifier for disk that Windows Server 2016 enforces. So in, in my case, for my hardware that I have, um, if this was running Windows Server 2016 and I was trying to figure out a storage space using the Server Manager GUI, uh, what will happen is that when I go to create a storage space in Windows Server 2016 with this hardware, um, it will only see a single hard drive. And that's due to the fact that my crappy controller only um, sends one unique identifier. So every every drive has the exact same identifier. And Windows Server 2016 detects that, and so it thinks you only have one drive. So apparently the Windows 10 GUI um, does not care. It doesn't look at that unique identifier. It doesn't use that as um, the be all for um, picking this. So just something I kind of want to point out because it's something that I, I noticed as I um, experimented with doing this on Windows Server 2016 versus on Windows 10. There, there are some noted differences, especially with um, um, essentially unsupported hardware. In, in my case, that's, that's a rig controller that just doesn't do the right thing that the server is expecting it to do. All right, so moving on down the list. So um, say if you have some disks that are currently like unspecified, you're not, you don't have uh, it's specified if it's like HDD or um, SSD, um, this is a good way how you can go and um, see that. So I have a variable called unspecified disk, and then I'm going and um, running my my pool. So actually, I probably should change the order of this. Um, uh, I already ran my pool, but um, so say if you just ran this directly. Um, in like one go, um, this one this one would have failed because my pool wasn't defined yet. Um, just kind of want to point that out. So um, we'll go say my pool. Go ahead and set that variable, and now I'll go my pool. Let's see what's in there. So again, it's in that degraded state because that SSD is full, uh, but um, HDD only. Um, it's in warning. It's kind of telling me what size it has and all of that information. So if I go and do the second one here, um, what this does, um, it goes look at that same pool. So this my pool HDD only, that's in the my pool variable. Then it goes and look at all the physical disks that are assigned to that pool. And then it goes to look if there's any that has a media type that is unspecified or has UNS in it. So instead of typing in unspecified, I did it that way. So I'll go ahead and run that and go look at the unspecified disk variable. So there we go. So that's that's that one drive that I'm already aware of that that four terabyte drive that I added. Uh, I haven't set that um, that media type flag on there. So uh, it'd be a good idea to do that. So as far as Windows 10 is concerned, um, whether I set that variable or not, um, the the pool essentially works and it just treats treats every drive the same. It like you didn't do anything with that flag. But when you start moving on and doing things like tiering, um, that flag becomes very important because then um, that flag determines as you create your tiers, um, which drives pull, gets pulled into the different tiers. So um, there's actually three different classes of storage. Um, well, actually, there may be more in the later releases, but um, I believe I'm only exposed to four different class. I mean, three different classes on this particular release that I'm on here. Um, so I'll show that a little bit later down in the code. All right, so that's unspecified disk. So next one here, I have uh, my pool. And then um, here, I'm just 
pulling some data off of um, what the physical disk has. So this is just a git command. So I, I will go, go ahead and safely run that. So that'll just show me, okay, every drive that I've added to the pool. So I can see my two SSDs up there at the top. And then I have a whole lot of hard drives. And then I have that one hard drive that I didn't set the flag on that four terabyte drive. All right, so moving on down the list here. Uh, this is where you get more into where you're going to actually configure your tiers or, or create the tiers. So in my case, I don't want to run any of these commands, so I have everything um, commented out. Because uh, again, I, I don't want to create any tiers since I've already already done a lot of this. So, but I just kind of want to show you what some of the code looks like to do that. So again, I'm using that my pool variable, um, which was specify up here. So get storage pool HTTP only. So again, whatever you name your pool, you'll have to replace that with your own name. And then I'm piping that to new storage tier. Then I'm giving it a friendly name. So you can name this whatever you want. I, I just, oops, don't want to move that. Um, you can name this whatever you want. I just named the SSD tier to make it clear and easy to read. And then you specify the media type. And um, as far as media type, there's actually three options. There's SSD um, storage, uh, SSD storage, regular spinning rust HDD, and then there's there's new type SCM. Um, and that's, uh, I believe it's for like server class memory. So it's kind of like a, uh, it, it's pretty much almost as fast as RAM, um, so a little bit faster than NVMe even. even. And this is so this is the newer um, storage class memory that um, some newer servers and things that they have. And uh, I actually just kind of stumbled across that. I didn't even know you could do this in Windows 10. I thought it was only um, exposed on the server side, but um, um, it's actually visible here. Uh, on the desktop as well, so that's, that's kind of neat. But um, unfortunately, I, I don't have any access to any SCC, SCM class storage to see how that interacts. So I, I don't know with with these. I don't know if you can now do a three stage cheering Possibly, I'm, I'm not really sure if that's a possibility in the newer versions of server or not. But this this is something that I kind of stumbled across as I was using this. All right, so next thing here um, where you can go and check your tiers configuration. So I have a variable, my storage tier config, and then I'm just going and getting some data off my storage tiers after I created them. And, and note there, there are some built-in um, storage tiers that you could use as opposed to creating your own. Uh, I just kind of want to just demonstrate that you can create your own tiers or, or you can use those built-in ones. Um, so when I, when I run this, it's actually going to be more um, options than um, what I um, created. So let's go ahead and run that. All right, so and then go ahead and look at that variable, my storage tier config. So there we go. So you can see um, see these other tiers that's here. So see this HDD tier, um, standard HDD tier, standard SSD tier. So I believe those two are the one, those are kind of built in. Um, this SSD tier, HDD tier, those are the ones I created as I was experimenting with things. And these, these two tiers here are the ones that I'm actually using now in my um, storage space. So that's kind of cool. So let's keep on going down the list. Let's clear up some of this data down here. All right, so next, as you kind of keep going down the list here, you have get storage supported size. Um, so in my lab right now, since I have that SSD not attached, this is going to not work. Um, but um, what it will do is that, so say, um, you can have it go and test and see, okay, based on the drives and data you have, and if you're going to use a simple um, um, resiliency setting, how much storage do I have? How, what can I do? It's essentially what this would do. Um, oh, I need to be, ele I'm not elevated. Huh, I didn't realize that that needed an elevation to work. So that's, that's kind of interesting, even considering that's a, a, um, that's just a git command, so that requires elevation apparently. So let's go ahead and run an elevated command. That's thinking about it. Yeah, that's fine. And where did I store that file? Can I do this? Actually, I'll just copy it, copy everything, and just open a new blank file. So I'm going to actually have to run these variables again, a couple of them, just so I can have those variables populate as I get farther down the code. Um, my pool, go ahead and run that one. 
just going to run the ones that are not um, not changing anything. They're just getting data. So I don't want to change anything. I'm going to step to those. Go ahead and run that variable. Uh, was I around here? All right, so let's let's run that. So um, as I mentioned, that's well, huh, surprise. Um, I didn't expect it to actually show anything there, but um, oh, okay, interesting. Um, okay, so um, what this does, it looks at like okay, all the drives and things that you have um, within your pool. What is the supported minimum size and supported sizes and things like that you can do with that particular particular resiliency setting? This is kind of what that's telling. So my HD tier. So if I change this to mirror and run that command again, see the numbers change, right? So it's based on um, the storage that I have available um, within my pool. Um, these are kind of the, the sizes, min, max, and the divisor um, that I can use for, for that. Um, so maybe it might just be the SD, SSD tier that's not going to work because that's the only tier that's broken at the moment. Yeah, okay, there we go. That's kind of what I expect to see, but yeah, since it's, it's only that my, SS, my SSD tier is the one that's impacted right now, so it's pretty much telling me, hey, you can't do anything different right now, especially with Mirror, because I only have one drive at the moment. So it's, it's realizing that, that, hey, I'm in a degraded state, um, so as far as this test is concerned, I can't do anything regarding, I can't make another Mirror or anything like that until I... Um, plug in back in that disk or replace it with a new one or whatever I want to do with that. So yeah, so that, that's why we're seeing that. And the same thing with, with Simple, it realized that, hey, I have two um, drives in there right now, or the system think I had two, but only one is present right now. Only one is appears to be working right now. So um, when I run this test, um, essentially, the test is essentially failing to say, hey, you can't, you can't do anything. Just, just leave it alone. <laughs> All right. All right, so moving on, configure resiliency for pool. So I'm not going to run this command off either. So I, again, we're seeing the my pool. I'm pulling my my pool variable. And then what I can do, I can set what type of resiliency I want to have. So um, for a simple pool, say if I create a simple um, VDIS on this pool, how many columns do I want it to have? So this is going to vary, vary depending on your environment. So um, as, as you saw in those benchmarks that I, that I demonstrated, um, you see you can get dramatically faster um, um, performance by using different sets of columns. So in my environment, I have, um, I guess, 15 hard drives and two SSDs. So theoretically, I could set my resiliency setting here to 17, right? And it would, it would, it would stripe the data across all 17 drives, and I would get very, very good performance. Um, downside of that, any one of those drives have any problems or dies, all my data is gone. So, um, but I have it at 14, so um, say if I were to do that, I, I could strike data across 14 drives, um, I have three other drives, so it, it'll, it'll use 14 different drives, so every time, it won't always use the exact same 14 drives, out of the 17, it'll use 14 out of those and move data around and things like that as, as it reads and write data. And as we move down here, um, I kind of put a, another note in here. Note that I can only use a higher column count in my lab on a non-tier space. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, on my tier space, I'm restricted on the number of columns I can have because of my SSD tier. I only have two SSD drive, and since that's a mirror, so I, I technically only have one column. That, that, is, that is my restriction. But that, that is really my limit on my mirror space side. But however, if I'm creating a non-tiered space um, and I'm just going to use all, all of my drives, then I can actually go up to, um, actually I can go up to eight because I have 16, I have 17 drives, right? Um, so I could actually have a, a mirror setting, a non-tiered setting only um, up, up to eight, which would pretty much mirror that data across 16 drives and um, pretty much I'll have eight active drives um, per read and write. So I, I should get really good performance out of that because it'll spread that reads and writes across eight of those drives. And then anything that occurs on those eight drives, it'll duplicate it on another different set of eight drives within my um, within my pool. Um, but in, in case of, of my space and, and for case of tiering, 
Um, my setting, in this case, actually has to be one. Has to be one. That, that's really my only option because I have that tiered space restriction. Um, so that's that's something that I kind of learned and started understanding how the tiering and um, these columns settings can impact um, not only performance but also um, what you can actually do, what setting will actually work and what, what won't based on the number of disks you have in each tier. All right. So moving down, um, again, I'm really using that my pool variable, so I'm going to check the resiliency. So that's after I've um, set these settings and things like that. So you, there are other resiliency settings, so there's like parity, but um, I don't use parity because, um, I did, like I said, I've done a lot of experiment with a lot of different settings and values, and, and the parity was, it just was, it was, just was terrible. Um, I, I, I got some better space utilization um, definitely out of it. Um, but the performance impact was was significant where I, I just don't want to use it. Um, so much so is that, like, say if I were to just not use storage spaces at, at all and use the RAID um, parity, like RAID 5 from my controller, um, that was actually significantly faster than what I got with storage spaces. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Your, your mileage may vary, but that's just from my experience with the controller I have, with the drives I have, with using storage spaces parity versus using the parity um, capabilities of my RAID controller. The, the RAID controller was, was, was better. Um, so mileage may vary. I might have did something weird or wrong with my settings, um, but that's just been my experience with it up to this point. So, all right. So going over to check resiliency for pool, I'll just go ahead and run that. So that'll just spit out what my current settings are. Um, so you do always have the option of setting the columns and thing in the number of groups and all that stuff into auto if you want. And then based on the number of drives and things you have, it'll it'll make a decision and, and pick something for you. Um, in my case, I've I changed those, especially since I'm using the tier space, I changed that. So my number of columns is one. Physical disk redundancy for a mirror, I have two data copies, right? So um, one column is two copies of the data, um, right, in, in the mirror. And then the column is how many um, um, slices am, am I going to divide that into, right? So two times one, two times one would be two. So that means for every one column, I need two drives, right? So if I, again, if I change that to five, that means I would need 10 drives for that same thing. But um, I'll, I'll get better performance because I'm stretching that. Instead of like when I read or write, I'm only using the performance of one disk. Um, and then that whatever changes I make to that disk is being mirrored to one other disk. So two disks are being used, but like I'm really getting the performance of one um, for that. But as I, like I said, if I change the column to five, then it would be cross 10 disks. And then I get the performance of five disks. And that whatever change in those five is being duplicated to the other set of five. Um, so yeah. Um, I haven't experimented with changing the interleave. I normally just leave that as, as the default. Um, there may be some benefits to manipulating that, but I haven't done any extensive benchmarking or anything to see what that impact would be. Um, but there may be some impact there. I just haven't experimented with it. But yeah, so that's what that show. So then I go down another. I can um, create virtual disks with tiering. It's kind of what the idea behind this section is. So I can get my storage tier. Go ahead and run that. That's going kind to of show me. So I've already, like I said, I've already configured this. So um, on, on one that I have, we see that we have tier VM space one HDD tier. You see that's tagged that as capacity tier. Um, it's mirrored. Physical disk redundancy of one. Currently using five terabyte um, usable, um, but it's taking up 10 terabyte on the actual pool. And that gives me a storage efficiency of about 50%. So um, half of my storage is, is being taken up in, in mirrored. Um, same for the SSD tier, um, mark this performance, um, SSD is mirrored again, um, size 200 gigabyte, footprint on pool 400 gigabyte, 50%. So if you're using something like Parity, um, the efficient storage efficiency would be a lot, lot better. Or um, if you're using Simple, like, again, it will be 100% efficiency because you're, you're getting all your storage since you're not, you have no redundancy in that case. But um, that, that what this kind of spits out. So if you want to Figure that um, I have a variables cache tier, and then I'm just going and getting my tier and with friendly name of SSD tier, putting that in, throwing that into a variable. 
And then I'm kind of doing the same thing for my data tier, putting that into a variable so I can use it later. So if I just go in and like run cache tier, right, or run um, data tier, um, they would kind of show me show me the information for that. In the case like you saw up here, my tier is actually named something different, the one that I'm actively using right now. But if you're like creating these, um, that it'll it'll be it'll have something in there. But like mine's already been created. All right, so the next part um, um, after you've done all that is that now you need to create a virtual disk on top of the pool, right? So um, just using my, my pool variable again, so I'm still using that same pool, then I'm doing a new virtual disk, give it a friendly name. I tell the pool um, what the resilience setting will be for that um, for the disk, if I'm gonna be simple mirror or whatever it may be. And uh, actually, the, that one. I'm not going to run this, any of this, so I'm just going to want to show you the code. All right, so real resiliency setting name, simple. Storage tiers. So here now, remember um, above, I set those variables. So I'm telling it, okay, uh, for my storage tiers, um, this first one here is my cache tier. So, and then the second one is the data tier. So it knows um, it's going to put that cache tier in front of the data. So as stuff come in, it's going to hit that, that cache faster SSD tier, and then it'll destage it down to the data tier. And then storage tier size. So the first number again is the tier, the size that I want for my cache tier, and then the second is the size that I want for my data tier. And then you have this write cache size variable. So by default, I'll give you a one gigabyte write gig write cache size. So you can increase that if you have like extra SSD that you're not going to use for the, the performance tier. You if you can use that same drive um, to accelerate um, inbound cache. I mean in, inbound writes will get accelerated by the SSD tier. Uh, for you. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how you will, you will create your virtual disk. So once you have your virtual disk there, you can go and create um, volumes and things like that on top of it, um, be like using your whatever tool you want, or you can do it through PowerShell and do it through GUI or, or whatever um, once that's there. But um, all of this, you, you actually have to do it in PowerShell. Um, there, there's no way to do this um, in Windows 10 that I'm aware of through the GUI. There, there's no way to do it. And then in the case of my hardware, there's actually no way to do it in Windows Server 2016 either because um, it doesn't like my hardware. Um, but it, I can do it through PowerShell and it works on Windows 10 as well as on Windows Server 2016, um, but I have to do it through PowerShell. And then finally, after I've um, done all that, I can kind of just go and check a look at what I configured, um, take a look at my pool and get my resiliency settings. Um, I can maybe go and look at other things as far as how my um, how my virtual disks are looking and, and things like that. There's other a lot of other things you can kind of go do. Um, other neat things about this, once you start doing things like tiering, you can actually um, tag certain files to, um, like, say, only reside on the SSD tier. So, for example, if you had a file, a file that you don't really want it to be destaged down to, to the hard disk drives, you can kind of tag that file. Um, you have to do it through PowerShell. You can tag that file, or um, is that the right terminology? Um, I'm saying tag. Um, I'm trying to think what the terminology is. Um, what is the terminology? Yeah, I can't, I can't think of what the terminology is that it shows in PowerShell. Uh, but but essentially you're instructing the storage pool that say for this this for this file um, um, never like always put it on the SSD tier and never never move it down never destage it so that that tier will always be accelerated by the SSD or you can do the opposite and like tag something to only reside on HDD so it, it'll just stay down there and, and like as it get hot it won't um, elevate itself back up into the SSD tier and remain there. You can kind of do it, do it both ways. So I believe you can do it both ways. I think I've only done it the other way where I, I know, I know definitely you can do it where you, you can tag something and have it remain on the SSD. Um, I'm assuming you can do it the other way, but I'll have to verify that. That, that may be your wrong information. I, I don't think I've ever done it the opposite way. Um, but, um, there, there's probably a way to do that as well. So yeah, I hope this was, um, Helpful is kind of a um, somewhat of a deep dive into um, what I what I've learned in storage spaces over the last couple of years. Um, all of it may not be 100% accurate, um, but this is kind of what my experience what it's been with um, essentially unsupported 
hardware, uh, where, where I was able to get it to work. Um, I'm definitely get, seeing the benefit of it, of using the tiering, and it uh, definitely has accelerated uh, the experience that I, that I get on my, uh, within my lab. Um, all, all the while, I still have um, a lot of storage to work with because I, I get the acceleration of things coming in, hitting the SSD, so I get that really good response time as I'm um, interacting with hot data. And then as I'm not using that data, I, I'm getting the benefit of the large storage um, array that's backing that um, in the, in the uh, 15 hard drives that are they're, they're behind there. So yeah, I uh, hope, hope this um, little crash course has been useful. And I'll see you in the next one. But wait, there's a little bit more. So I forgot, I, I wanted to just kind of drive this point home or, or let you see this as well. Um, <clears throat> so I've um, actually ran these benchmarks um, again on, e on each tier of drive. And um, actually some interesting things came out of it. So take the uh, PowerShell created five column two-way mirror. Um, first run, uh, we got these results. Second run, we got largely, pretty much almost identical results. Um, some small variability, but for the most part, pretty much exact same performance, right? Take a look at the iDrive. Um, we got these results the first time. Take a look at the second run. Uh, we got largely the same results. Um, I did notice one anomaly that popped out. Um, notice in this case, on the uh, 4KB QDEP of 32 with one thread, um, the performance actually dropped from what we had the first time. And I speculate what the, why we got such a lower performance number this time is because the SSD that's in the same pool, um, it, it was picked a few times randomly less than it was the first time. So that resulted in the slower performance. So now we jump up to the tier storage. So if, if you recall, the first time we ran the benchmark, right, the SSD, I mean, the tiered space was actually slower in a lot of benchmarks on the read side. Um, so we only were getting 155 megabyte. Um, on the read side, and two megabyte, these numbers here in the middle were actually worse, it was worse of the bunch. Um, the right numbers were decently okay, so near near the near the top, mid pack for everything. So by the time I ran it again, now look at the reads. The reads were roughly double. Um, well, the writes were almost double. The reads were um, not quite double, but significantly improved. The um, the reads at QDEF eight with eight threads was um, actually like a three, almost four time improvement, right? And then by the third run, look, look what's happened. Now the reads on the, these same drives, now the reads are actually rivaling what we're getting from the five column two-way mirror now. We're almost at the that their level. Um, the right performance, best in class at this point um, out, of, out of the, the list there. And then look at what's happening here. Like these numbers have skyrocketed uh, way better than anything else in the list, right? By multiple factors, like a factor of like 10, 15 um, for the most part. So significantly faster on, on those reads from those. And then the writes, writes um, they didn't get too much faster, so we're still kind of limited to that. But as you can see, the, the reads got dramatically faster um, the more we, we ran the same test. Um, and you didn't see that behavior down here on either one of these other tiers. And, and a large reason for that is that um, with the tier spacing, so it's learning. It's learning what data you're reading regularly, like the data that's becoming hot. It's saying, hey, um, yeah, this this data that you keep on reading this, and I have space available in my SSD tier. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to leave that data up in that tier because you're, you're reading that data frequently. So that that's what's accounting for this. Um, as we kept reading that same data, like for like the third time, the performance has gotten dramatically better because most of the data is now being read from the SSD tier as opposed to um, like when we first read it for the first time, we were reading all that data from pretty much from the hard drives. And then by the time that third time we read it, um, we're reading it all from the SSD tier now because it's been elevated up to the SSD tier. So this is kind of a, a like I said, a benefit that's maybe not be obvious of what's happening in the background. Um, and this is even without you pinning anything to like a particular tier, um, it's doing that automatically in the background for you. Um, to accelerate accelerate um, the reads and writes and, and uh, as I mentioned, like reduce the latency. And this would improve, like start improving more and more if I, uh, if I had uh, more SSDs, um, say if I would swap out some of these HDDs for um, SSDs and put those in my performance tier, um, this would 
accelerate even more and, 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 and improve even more. Because I'm uh, in this with the tier space, I'm purposely using those SSDs to accelerate the workloads, as opposed to if I'm just using a, a regular storage space that happened to have some SSDs in there, uh, we will just randomly sometimes get a benefit, uh, but not not consistently uh, at any any level of consistency because sometimes it won't use the SSDs, and I'll, I'll um, sometimes it won't pick the SSDs for the the reason rights and things like that. So. Um, Again, this this is it. <laughs> Hopefully, this was helpful, and I'll see you.